In, in one lecture, Prabhupada was saying how each verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam requires a very intense study, and that each mantra is a form of poetry and very deep, and, and it would require a month of study of each verse in order to fully understand each verse. And since there are 18,000 verses, it, he said in this lecture that it would come to something like 1,500 years, and there was a bit of laughter because you know, it could, could live that long. But he said, if you really wanted to study Srimad Bhagavatam, that's how important each verse is. It, it requires a, a month of study. And I, I believe that, uh, that uh, there's, a, there's a, it's kind of well known that, that the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati lectured for three months or six months on the first uh, canto, the first verse, the first uh, uh, chapter, and the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So they are very deep. And uh, <clears throat> Prabhupada cited an example of someone, I think it was a politician in India who came to see Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And he was, very amazed that he could publish kind of literature in such uh, luminous quantities. There was a publication in uh, Bengali called Nadia Prakash. And, and that came out quite regularly. I don't know if it was a daily or a monthly, I think it was quite frequently. So this man was quite amazed that he could write so 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 much material about so so many so much information about something so obscure as transcendental knowledge. And Bhakti Siddhanta then pointed out that this wasn't really that unusual. He pointed out that the spiritual world is actually three, is three times the size of the material world. For one thing, the Ekapada Bhuti as opposed to the Tripada Bhuti. Tripada Bhuti being the spiritual world. Prabhupada mentions this also in, I think it's in the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the size of creation. Three fourths of which is spiritual and one quarter of which is, is material, material world. So he elaborated on this, Bhakisana today. He said that actually there are many different universes. And the city of Calcutta is just one small city. There are many cities of its size. There are many there are many cities of this size on this planet. This planet is just part of this particular universe, and there are many millions of such universes. And that's just the material world, and the spiritual world is much larger. So what's the difficulty, he said, of, of writing anything of such a, of, you know, of so much length, or so publishing it so frequently? He said the problem is that there's a great shortage of, of customers. We, we could publish something every second, every minute, many pages long about the spiritual world, but people wouldn't, wouldn't uh, buy it. So there, there's no market for it, unfortunately. So, and he's known for saying that, that uh, the only shortage that exists in the world is Krishna consciousness, that people are, are, are worried about food shortage, water shortage, this and that shortage. But the only shortage, he said, was of Krishna consciousness, that people, that, that it's a godless world, and that people, the only real shortage is the shortage of God consciousness. Material creation. So this is one of the things that Prabhupada was saying. So in these verses, even though this is, is not very very popular, and, and Prabhupada didn't lecture on so much on, on the verses in the fifth canto, each verse is actually very important. So he's written, I think, very long purports to explain what he wanted to explain. One of the things that, that recurs so much in many of the, in, of the verses that he was explaining was the, the fact that we're not the body. It just kept coming back to that, even though there are there a lot of details. And, and uh, in some of the verses, in, in, some, in some cases, the, the uh, Mahabharata and the Ramayana are considered part of the Vedas, although they're not part of the original four Vedas. The Mahabharata sometimes is called the fifth Veda. But he said that, that it, there's a lot of historical detail in there, in the Mahabharata, a lot of information that's historical, and, a lot of details. And in one sense it seems like it's not spiritual. But actually, everything that's, that's done by devotees it has a spiritual dimension to it. We may be doing things that are, are very seemingly un, unrelated to spiritual topics, raising a family, crunching numbers, doing so many things. But because the philosophy of Christian consciousness is, is there in the heart of, of, of all such people, they take it as, as a very significant, and it becomes spiritual, even though it's not 
on, on, on you know, from the, from the outer appearances to spiritual. And in, in one class I remember Prabhupada was saying that, the, that uh, this place is a spiritual place. He was talking about a, a temple in a, in a neighborhood that was a house converted into a temple. And he said, what's the difference between this house and the house next door? He said, we're all doing the same thing. We're eating, we're sleeping, we're cooking, we're going out. But the difference is that in this place, this is a temple because Krishna is here. And in the house next door, there is no Krishna. So it's, not, it's just an ordinary dwelling as part of the material world. So what makes, it, what makes everything different is, is the fact that Krishna is there. We live in a very godless world. In, in the world that we live in, God is a very unpopular concept. I, had, I gave a class once in uh, Boston, and God was, and most of the people in that class were from our university, from MIT, and from Boston University. There's a saying in America, they call them the Boston Brahmins, because it's, it's considered the intellectual part of the United States, the, uh, the Northeast, especially up, up in that area around Boston, the Boston Brahmins. So, God was so unpopular, when I was giving this lecture, I didn't say God, I just said the G word. Because, you know, if you say God, it, it's like, people are ready to throw rocks at you. There was a Hindi proverb, the proverb once quoted, said that if you, if you speak lies, you can illusion the whole planet. There's, there's a Hindi proverb, that if you speak the truth, people will come at you with, with rocks and logger and heads. Logger heads being, being big sticks. So that's a Hindi proverb. It's kind of interesting that that, uh, that even though we're you know kind of you know very happy and very very enthusiastic to be in the association of devotees that that, we're, that Christian consciousness is actually very small in terms of the total number of people on the planet. It's actually very small, but this because it's very potent, it really doesn't matter. It's very small, and I think well, I said one time. That Christian consciousness is not a matter of gaining popularity, we're not engaging in a popularity contest. So in one sense, we don't really, really care if, if people don't think it's, if, 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 you know, it's just kind of a small step and it's not too important. And in a way it's kind of good that we're sort of off the radar screens, but in another way it's, it's kind of tragic that it's not more prominent. Of course, in the Vishya Purana, it's predicted that Christian consciousness would be very prominent for a long period, I think it's 10,000 years. It's something like having summer in the middle of the winter. And that happens sometimes. Once I was in a car in London in January. In January in that part of the world it's usually very cold and dismal and rainy. But for some reason it was very sunny and warm for about 10 days. And, and I noticed that the cherry blossoms were coming out of the trees. It was actually summer in the middle of winter. So it happens sometimes. So it appears that this is going to happen according to the Misha Quran and other predictions. We can get the actual judgment not already around so Dr. Pachar and Haide Moriyanam has predicted that Krishna consciousness, Krishna's name, the holy name of Krishna will be sung in every town and village. And that's in the Chaitanya Chaitanya, uh, Chaitanya Bhagavad, that, uh, that phrase. And I think I'll probably also quotes it in the Chaitanya Chaitanya. And the Misha Quran has predicted that there would be a period of uh, great piety in the middle of Kali Yuga. Some people have said that as long as near period has already begun because Christian consciousness is spreading all over the world through different through traveling, through the internet and through airplanes and things like that. So maybe, I don't know. Just just I'm just guessing. Prabhupada has been writing in his purport that that uh, Krishna didn't have to appear in this room. He didn't come for his own personal reasons, he just came to see the devotees. So it's, it's uh, written in, in the Bhagavatam, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, that Purch Tanaya Satanam Vinachaya Shushkutam. That Krishna comes with two objectives. One is to annihilate the divine population, another is to save the devoted population. Actually, when he came to dispatch Rani Kashipu, it was uh, said to be sort of an incidental thing, that, that his real reason, his inner reason for coming was to see Prahlad Maharaj to console him and to be, to pat him, he patted him on the head with his claws, a half machine, or a half lion, a half man incarnation. But his real purpose was to, was, was that, his internal purpose was that. And so even though Prabhupada said that, that uh, Krishna comes to annihilate the demonic elements, 
He also, he, his internal reason is to, is to uh, see and to console and to, and to answer the prayers of the devotees. That's his real internal reason to come. And in one lecture I heard Prabhupada say that, that, Prabhupada, that uh, Krishna's killing of the demons is done kind of incidentally in an almost nonchalant way. I think, I don't know if he used the word nonchalant, but that was the idea. And he gave the example of someone who's on, on a tour going to another country and sees an incidental thing that he, that, uh, he or she wants to buy in a shop, and so he buys that. But that's not the real purpose of, of going to that other place. It's just to enjoy the, the seashore or a different atmosphere or whatever. But if there's something interesting to buy, it's done kind of incidentally or nonchalantly. And so Prabhupada was saying that Krishna's killing of demons is like that. He, he, it's, it, he doesn't have to, to uh, exhibit a great deal of, of fighting spirit. He doesn't have to do that, but he, he does it to just, it's part of his leela. And, and just as fighting is part of human beings, it, it, they sometimes, sometimes the father engages in his child in a mock fight. It's, it's kind of like that, Krishna doesn't do it. But for an ordinary person, they have to become very, very uh, angry in order to fight. In fact, I, I think I heard this on a lecture, I heard someone say that, that uh, the whole purpose of Bhagavad Gita was for Krishna to, to uh, get Arjuna to become angry. He was, Arjuna is a, is a very great soul, so he didn't want to take arms against his own, his own men. And the, the, whole, uh, the whole purpose of the Bhagavad Gita was that, that Krishna would, would incite Arjuna to become angry. And it was because he couldn't actually engage in fighting unless he became angry. He didn't want to become angry with his own friends and relatives and teachers, but he, he had to do it because Krishna wanted him to do it. And so, so some, at a certain point, he actually exhibited anger, although anger is not necessarily a good quality, but Krishna wanted it done, so it was done because Krishna wanted it done.